Good morning. Can you all hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. All right. Good. Because I was using a microphone I never used before. So we're going to talk uh, the next uh, in this talk about the threat to a Nebraska deer from chronic wasting disease. Um, every species has its own set of diseases, own set of parasites. Uh, deer have a number of interesting diseases and parasites. But one of the major uh, maladies on the uh, sort of medical horizon are called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. And to make this simple, they all share in common a change in the shape of an otherwise normal protein into what's called a prion, which causes a neurodegenerative disease. And these are some familiar examples. Uh, chronic wasting disease, cervids, scrapie, uh, mad cow disease, and the disease has also been detected in uh, mink, some cats, and of course in humans, there's creutzfeldt jakob disease and a variant of that. <clears throat> Transmissible spongiform encephalopathies are widespread in mammals. Uh, this is a phylogeny of 102 species of mammals where my uh, former master's student, Brittany Buchanan, and I mapped the presence of TSEs. And what you can see for the, in the red dots is that it's not, these TSEs are non-randomly distributed uh, and they look like they've arisen recently in a number of different mammal groups. <clears throat> So lots of uh, mammals have TSEs. Um, TSEs are not like your typical disease. Uh, prions behave nothing like viruses or bacteria. Uh, they're not living. Uh, they don't reproduce per se. Uh, they can survive in the soil and in the environment for a very long time and remain infectious. So I think the, the best way to think of a prion is as an ever accumulating environmental toxin that can be found uh, for long periods of time after they are deposited. In the mid-1960s in Colorado, in a study on uh, winter forage of, of sheep and mule deer, uh, mule deer obtained a disease that was possibly from their co sheep cohort um, that was a transfer of prions from scrapie um, hosting sheep uh, to deer. This was later recognized as a TSC and later termed chronic wasting disease. Elk are also susceptible. These prion diseases, these TSCs are fatal. There are no known cures. There are no known vaccinations for these prion diseases. So they're really nasty. The length of time that a deer or an elk um, survives post-infection, it varies dependent on its genotype at the prion gene and how old it is when it got um, infected. So how did it get infected? Um, the insidious thing about CWD is that it can be transferred directly between individuals uh, or they can get it from urine, feces, or saliva. So mutual preening, for example, can transfer it. Uh, prions remain in the environment in the soil for a long period of time. We think that possibly rodents, coyote feces, crows can transmit prions. In utero, if a doe can give a fawn prions in utero, uh, prions have been found, CWD prions have been found in buck semen. And it's possible that in an area where there was a deer that died or prions were deposited by a deer, uh, plants could uptake them into their tissues and then be eaten by deer. So. Um, it's rough out there if you're trying to avoid these prions. It's not easy to do. And this just shows how it spread rapidly in North America. Started out Colorado. Uh, took 10 years before it took off, but then once, once it took off, um, it really took off. Uh, Robert, we had someone uh, wanted to know if you could quick uh, put your PowerPoint in the presenter view. Um, if you want to just hit uh, display settings on the top of your screen and then select switch view. Okay. Uh, switch to... Um, there we go. Okay, yeah, it was in okay. presenter view on my other screen, sorry. No, I've had that problem too, so thank you. Okay, um, and so here we have uh, it spread. And then, you know, that might not be all that interesting to you where it's spread throughout the country, but here's an example from southwestern Sauk County in Wisconsin where there's a major CWD outbreak. And 
in 2002, the incidence of CWD was around zero. And 18 years or 16 years later, almost 60% of all the adult males had CWD. So, you know, some people, some rock musicians that think they know a lot about disease biology uh, are saying that this is just because of increased testing, which is familiar in another disease format that's popular right now. Um, it's not that. It's the incidence of CWD. Deer tested in 2002 didn't have it. In 2018, almost 60% of the bucks, and in some areas, almost 70%. That's also true that adult deer have higher prevalence than yearlings and males have a higher prevalence than females. So we think that's possible because bucks travel over larger distances and if they're, if they're infected, then they spread it more easily. In Nebraska, uh, CWD was first found in the, in the Southwest in Kimball County and now uh, 20 years later encompasses 49 counties. <clears throat> in 2017, Nebraska Game and Parks tested uh, almost 2,000 hunter killed deer and found that 203 were positive, which was an increase, a dramatic increase over their previous testing. In 2019, from some different areas, 9.5% uh, tested positive. So what are the, some of the factors that cause chronic wasting disease and might help uh, slow it down? The prion gene genetically is a very simple gene. It consists of 71, 761 base pairs. Uh, and here is the sequence of the Nebraska whitetail. And underlined in about the middle, uh, right in here, are, are two triplets, uh, six base pairs that encode amino acids 95 and 96. It turns out that these amino acids play a role in the progression of CWD in an individual deer. So if a deer, if a whitetail has uh, glutamine at position 95, it's highly susceptible. If it has a histidine, it's the most resistant one we know about. And at position 96, there's a substitution from uh, glycine to serine that also makes deer more resistant. Now, this doesn't mean that they're immune. Uh, for example, in sheep, there's a mutation that uh, confers nearly complete, complete immunity to scrapie. But in deer, even though these genotypes are more resistant, it appears as though the deer still perish. And so it might, you might think, well, how can a couple of base pairs in a gene make any difference? Um, what happens to the normal protein gene, the normal prion gene, is that it folds in the cell into a shape, something like this, with pleats and folds and twists and turns. And when it undergoes transformation to a misfolded version, it has a very different shape. And this shape becomes like a, a, a toxin in the individual. And once one of these bad ones, the misfolded ones, touches a good one, it causes it to misfold. So it's kind of like a slinky that has a, you know, a bad uh, event going down the stairs. And they all tend to misfold. And then they clog the central nervous system and they are fatal. So back to these uh, genotypes, uh, in 2011, uh, Johnson and colleagues published this chart, which is uh, very interesting because it suggests that individual deer with this uh, H or S genotype live over 1,500 days post-inoculation. So what happened was the uh, investigators took concentrated prion solutions and fed them to naive fawns and watched what happened. Um, the sample size is very small. If you notice, there's maybe 10 deer here. But there was a distinct difference between these uh, bars at the bottom, which are the wild type or the glutamine uh, and the glycine, and how long these deer survived, which was almost two years, versus the primarily S ones and then the uh, H ones. So this suggests that the genotype of a deer will delay the progression of the disease to the point where uh, it becomes a fatal accumulation of prions. In Nebraska whitetails, 70% uh, are of the highly susceptible kind, 27% have the S and uh, very few have the H. So the, the uh, message is that the, the, it appears to be good news that the resistant gene is widespread in, a, in Nebraska. The problem is that it's in very, very low frequency. Muleys also get CWD. 
Um, and unlike whitetails, where there appears to be two or three different um, genotypes that provide some resistance, uh, in muleys, there's just one. Um, at position 225, if they have a, a phenylalanine instead of serine, and only 5% of these deers have reduced susceptibility, and they're kind of widespread, but they're in such low frequency that in both mule deer and whitetails, you'd have to consider the herd equally vulnerable throughout the range uh, if you're just looking at these genetic aspects, these markers. And not every susceptible deer has CWD. For example, of the uh, deer tested by uh, the uh, UNL Vet Diagnostic Center um, that had 95 position glutamine, uh, roughly 50% of the whitetails were positive and about 50% of the muleys were positive. Um, the histidine, the one that's more resistant, there was only one positive, eight negative, small samples, like again, they're not very frequent. Uh, serine 50-50 provides some resistance, although maybe not as much as we thought. And uh, for the 225Fs, it's supposed to be resistant, we didn't find this. Now, one of the possible reasons why uh, there's so many uh, negatives in the, in the serine is that if these deer were all uh, taken at different ages, uh, they might not have had enough time to contract CWD. It's possible that it hasn't been in the environment long enough. And so in an area where maybe there was 50% of the deer with CWD, this could change dramatically. Uh, but this is what we found in uh, Nebraska muleys and whitetails. One solution suggested by many people is that we just go out and shoot all the deer. Um, this is a viable management strategy very early in the on onset of a CWD event. Um, however, because prions accumulate in the environment, there's a growing environmental reservoir of prions that will continue to affect remaining deer irrespective of how many there are. So it doesn't appear to be um, density dependent. Where will we end up? Um, that's, you know, pure speculation at this point, but let's consider uh, this idea. Um, a deer is going to live a certain number of years depending on the age when it's infected and the genotype. So the earlier it's infected or the more individuals there are positive in the environment, the more deer they're going to be infected. A 95H deer might make it three or four years and have two or three breeding efforts and constitute 5% of the population, 96S might make a couple of breeding efforts, one or two, wild types, zero or one breeding effort. So most reproduction will be from deer with the 95 H and S. And if CWD continues to increase in the Nebraska deer herd, there could be a major population crash before these genotypes become more prevalent. But even then, deer aren't gonna live all that long and it's not clear what the population uh, makeup will be. If you're a trophy hunter, um, there's not gonna be many of these. Uh, it's unlikely that a deer is gonna live to be that age. And if it did, you probably wouldn't wanna shoot it anyway because um, it might have some super resistant genotype. Uh, lastly, a couple societal issues, um, economic impact and eating venison. Uh, deer hunting in Nebraska is a big economic part of the uh, uh, economy. Uh, in 2017, it was estimated that hunting had a, you know, almost a billion dollar impact, uh, lots of retail sales, sales and support some jobs. If deer hunting is severely reduced in Nebraska because of CWD or anything else, there'll be a major economic impact. Um, remember I said that of the 1800 deer checked at checkpoints, 200 of 11 were, 200 and some were positive. Each one of these was on its way to the dinner table because these deer had not yet reached the stage where clinical signs were obvious and the deer was staggering around, emaciated and in bad shape. So um, <clears throat> as CWD continues to increase and deer are continuing to be harvested at, at early stages, there's no question that we're eating deer that have um, prions in them. Whether there's enough prions or not, that's the question. In New York, there's an ongoing experiment began in, in 2005 at a wild game dinner where venison was served. Now New York had a rule that you have to test the deer before you serve it, but the test didn't have to precede the event. The deer of course tested positive for CWD and at present about 80 people are being followed for any signs of a TSC-like disease 
And so far, nothing has emerged. So that's the good news. Um, however, you know, if only 11% of the deer uh, in the environment has CWD in Nebraska, and most of them are taken at a very early stage in the infection, it's not clear that uh, it has the potential yet to be a major issue. And we know from mad cow that it might take a couple of decades for a person to get variant Crutzfeld's Jacobs disease after eating infected beef. I looked at the evolutionary gap between um, cows and humans and deer and humans. So if humans got uh, uh, this disease from uh, mad cow disease, um, why haven't humans gotten it from deer? And so this is part of uh, the phylogeny that I showed earlier. So the evolutionary distance from cow to human is the same as the evolutionary distance from deer to human. It actually goes back to a point here. And so it's not possible, it's not feasible that simple evolutionary distance or difference between the two prion genes is enough to provide some sort of resistance. So um, let me just go back. So we're, we're pretty sure at this point, no one's gotten a transmissible spongiform, spongiform encephalopathy from eating infected venison. Uh, the CDC recommends that you avoid eating one that was positive. Many people have eaten deer that are at least in the early stages of a CWD uh, progression. Nobody knows where in this disease stage a deer would have to be consumed before it present a risk to humans. Nobody really wants to find out. So it's prudence is probably the, uh, the best thing to do here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not terribly worried, but I'm 67. So uh, those of you that are younger might want to have your deer tested and then make a decision. Also, we've talked uh, a lot about just this prion gene called PRNP, um, which seems to play a, re a, re a role in resistance. A recent study of farm deer also found that other genetic factors uh, play a role in resistance. So we still have a lot to learn about the genetics of CWD and cervids. Um, hopefully it won't be as big a problem because we'd like to see this as our future uh, and not this. Okay, so I want to thank those that did the heavy lifting. Uh, Hernan uh, Vasquez, uh, Nadi Najjar, Dawn Loy, uh, Bruce Broderson, Maggie Olson, and Brittany Buchanan, and those that provided funding, Nebraska Game and Parks, and especially Todd Nardine for organizing our sampling, and the Pope and Young Club. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Robert.